On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled Outside the Box Webinar Series, Medication Technology, Smart Pumps, BCMA, and ADC. My name is Bob Yanish. I'll be your moderator for this program, and we welcome any comments or, or questions. Um, all materials are provided for your educational use. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Shirley Dominic and I are both patient safety liaisons with the Patient Safety Authority. We both interact with patient safety officers and other various healthcare staff to identify safety hazards, risks, and reduce patient harm. Shirley covers facilities in the South Central region of the state, and I cover facilities in the Southwest region. Also joining us today are three speakers from Reading Hospital, whom Shirley will introduce throughout the webinar. So let's start with uh, the term adverse events. The Office of Inspector General deems uh, adverse events as um, harm to a patient as a result of medical care or in a, med or in a health care setting, including failure to provide needed care. <laughs> um, the OIG reviewed a random sample of 770 hospitalized Medicare patients discharged from acute care during October of 2012. As you can see, one in four hospitalized patients experienced harm, and that's harm score F to I. Amazingly, out of that, 43% of the events were preventable. A 2012 OIG report found that only 14% of the patient harm events were actually reported into the internal incident reporting system. So what happened to the remaining 86%? How can we as patient safety professionals be proactive if we don't know what's happening in our own facilities? So how do we identify these adverse events? Well, um, OIG mentions a number of things. One of those being medical record reviews and the utilization of something called a, a global trigger tool. The global trigger, trigger tool was originally developed by the Insti Institute for Healthcare Improvement, better known as IHI, to systematically screen records for triggers or clinical cues that indicate patient harm. There's many sources for event reports. Um, if you've been following previous webinars in this series, which are gonna be available on our YouTube channel. Um, in January, we covered billing data, um, ICD-10 codes. February, um, we looked at patient reporting systems and complaints. Um, in March, we talked last month about audits, trigger or trigger tools, and chart reviews. Today, we have um, some great speakers that are gonna to talk to us about medication technology. And next month, we're gonna take a look at media and publications. We tend to key in on event reporting systems, but there's so many resources available to discover events. As shown as some of the examples here, and most of these center around four things, patients, providers, our internal environment, as well as the external environment. Shirley, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much for that, Bob. Good morning, everyone. So in a recent article published in February of 2023, ISMP focused on identifying errors outside of using an internal reporting system. Some highlights from that article include suboptimal optimal outcomes from internal reporting systems, the inappropriate use of error rates, utilizing error reporting as a barometer of safety culture, avoiding error rate comparison, Sharing system changes and error report outcomes with your staff. Understanding the significance of a trend. Investigating rare events that could lead to harm. And finally, detecting errors through other means, which is what we're going to focus on today. So on our screen here, you can see multiple forms of technology used throughout many healthcare systems we have barcode scanning, we have the electronic health record, we have smart pumps, and we have automatic dispensing cabinets. Uh, many innovations have occurred in technology to assist staff to safely order, dispense, and administer medications. 
In 2004, the FDA ruled that barcodes must be used on certain human drugs. Electronic medical records can provide warnings to providers when ordering medications or when a nurse is administering medications if it is contraindicated for some reason. Automated dispensing cabinets provide nurses with increased access to medications in patient care areas to facilitate timely administration of these medications. It ensures locked storage of medication on patient care unit and electronically tracks the use of controlled substances and other drugs. ABCs support the clinical review of medication orders by a pharmacist prior to administration if it is interfaced with the pharmacy computer and finally can be interfaced with barcode technology to automate the restocking process, track dispensing, and ensure electronic match between the prescribed and selected medication. Our smart pump usage can intercept errors such as wrong rate, wrong dose, or wrong pump setting. So our overall objectives for today's presentation, we are going to describe at least three ways technology can be used to identify medication safety events in a healthcare facility, identify opportunities to use gap analysis and best practices to respond to medication safety events, and finally, explain how the electronic health record can be used to proactively identify medication errors. It is my pleasure to introduce our first guest speaker, Megan Shai. Megan obtained her doctorate of pharmacy from the University of Pittsburgh and completed her PGY1 pharmacy practice res residency at Duke University Medical Center. She maintained certifications as a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and a certified professional in patient safety. For the past three years, Megan has served as the medication safety officer for Reading Hospital of the Tower Health System. With that, Meg, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Shirley, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to share information and review some literature on methods used to identify and address patient safety concerns related to medications. The first tool I'll review is medication use evaluations, or also referred to as MUE. The American Society of Health System Pharmacists published their guidelines for this methodology in 2021, and their definition is that a medication use evaluation is a systematic interdisciplinary performance improvement method that has the goal of optimizing patient outcomes via ongoing evaluation and improvement of medication utilization. This focus on patient outcomes differentiates an MUE from other methodologies such as a drug use evaluation and drug use review. There's seven common MUE objectives listed here. which may be undertaken to reach these goals. They range from optimizing therapy, such as determining the time and therapeutic range for a medication requiring pharmacokinetic monitoring, or minimizing costs when there's multiple therapeutic options to treat a condition. The objective we are focusing on is improving medication safety. For an MUE, the team would analyze all instances when a medication is used for the defined patient population and time period. This overcomes limitations of voluntary reporting to give a more broad picture of medication use. Voluntary reporting, however, is a useful trigger to identify an MUE topic. An incident report or two or more regarding a certain medication or clinical situation may indicate that a deeper dive investigation is warranted to address an opportunity. This slide shows the focus PDCA model as published in the ASHP guidelines. This framework can be useful for the MUA process, so I'll walk through the nine steps. Number one, you would find the process to target for improvement. This need could be identified by a number of sources. As noted, a voluntary incident report or staff report of a concern may prompt this investigation. Second, you'll want to organize your team that knows the process. You'll want to engage subject matter experts and stakeholders with authority for change. These teams may include pharmacists and pharmacy residents, students, and technicians. These stakeholders will vary by topic, but often include physicians, nurses, advanced practitioners, respiratory therapists, and other allied professionals, also informatics and data analytics. Third, you'll clarify the current knowledge, and this step is the real meat of the analysis. 
Here you define your criteria and methodology, generate reports, determine your sample size, and conduct your data collection, analyze that data, and then share those results with your team. In the fourth step, you'll understand the cause of process variation, and you want to seek to understand your data and current state outcomes. Here you'll consider if additional tools are needed. In the fifth step, you will select your process improvement and brainstorm with stakeholders for ideas and interventions that would address the root cause of the process variation. You'll consider the effectiveness of the strategy, favoring those with a higher leverage that don't rely on human memory. And now you're ready to enter that familiar PDCA cycle with step seven being P to plan your intervention. Uh, next would be do to carry out or implement that solution, followed by check to follow up on data collection and feedback. And finally, to act, to take the necessary steps to maintain that improvement, adjusting course or modifying as needed. And you'll also want to consider sharing your information externally with other organizations as well. Here's a list of common problems to be aware of and aim to avoid when you're conducting that MUE. It's important to note that the MUE is not a one person or one department task. It's necessary to have interdisciplinary and administrative support to successfully implement process change. I'd like to share topic examples for MUE that may be useful to consider. The first is somazenil utilization, and this often signals an adverse drug reaction to a benzodiazepine. Key stakeholders will include provider teams who prescribe these medications. Data points to consider when analyzing somazenil use may include identifying the implicated benzodiazepine with the dose, route, frequency, and indication for use, the concurrent medications that the patient was receiving, such as opioids, and of course, the patient outcomes and dispositions of your patients. The ensuing analysis may identify trends and opportunities with prescribing or monitoring or access to those medications. Another example I'll share is nifedipine immediate release. Unlike many other medications where different release formulations may be interchanged with appropriate dose adjustments to treat a patient condition, immediate release nifedipine is not recommended for an acute blood pressure reduction as it's associated with adverse cardiac effects. Voluntary incident reporting identified good catches by pharmacists in which a substitution was prescribed and the pharmacists intervened to ensure that the patient received the correct formulation. A deeper dive medication use evaluation was undertaken, and here I must give credit to my student, Meng Shi, who did the bulk of this work for us, to investigate all nifedipine immediate release orders for our system for several months. An action that was implemented as a result was to update the EMR to include prescribing information for all nifedipine orders and require inclusion of the indication specifically on the immediate release orders. And this is also a good example of a system learning from good catches to address a process vulnerability with medication prescribing. The next tool we'll take a look at is gap analysis. Gap analysis may be useful to compare an institution's current state practices with published best practice or guidelines. A number of sources should be considered for this information, such as publications from the Joint Commission, national or international guidelines or practice standards, and recommendations from professional societies. It's very helpful when there's an established benchmark for a desired outcome that organizations can align with. Once you have evaluated areas of opportunity, the previously discussed plan, do, study, act process can be helpful to progress towards the goals. Here are some examples of information sources for initiating a gap analysis to improve medication safety. A published medication error report may identify opportunities. ISMP best practices provide specific actionable recommendations. Joint Commission Sentinel event alerts could pertain to medication safety. And national organizations such as APHA, ASHP, AHRQ, could also be used. This tool is typically used proactively in response to external concerns. An example could be to review best practice recommendations published by ISMP 
for safe storage of neuromuscular blockers. This was something our organization did when we had a change in the automated dispensing cabinet equipment. For us, it was a good opportunity to review the recommendations for storage and alerts to ensure that we didn't have any unplanned or unexpected storage settings and that all best practices were being followed for a medication class with a high likelihood of harm if used in error. Next, we'll take a look at smart infusion pumps. Smart infusion pump technology with dose error reduction software has improved safe administration of IV medications over the past 20 years. In 2021, the Joint Commission published a Sentinel event alert regarding optimization of this technology. Important safety features include medication limits that can be imposed for the care area built into the drug library and both hard stop and soft stop limits for rate programming with guardrails. Health record integration is another safety opportunity. A 2013 study conducted by ECRI identified that while 28% of infusion errors could be prevented with dose error reduction software, 75% of the errors they saw would be prevented with integration between the electronic health record and the smart pump. In this alert, the Joint Commission provides eight recommendations which are listed here. First, it's suggested to designate a multidisciplinary team as responsible for overseeing and maintaining this technology. Next, it's recognized that designing and maintaining the library is essential to success, so a process needs to be defined to build and implement updates. Standardization for drug concentrations is recommended. Next, competency validation both for initial training and annual assessment is recommended for staff utilizing smart pumps. Number four, organizationally, it's recommended to establish the use of dose error reduction software as an expected practice. It should be obvious if an infusion is running outside of the guardrails profile. Next, it's recommended to monitor for smart pump overrides, adverse events, and near misses. This information should be used to evaluate drug library settings and pump program processes. Number six, uh, not all systems are programmed for this, but if possible, interconnect the smart pumps with the electronic health record. The seventh recommendation from the Joint Commission is evaluating for human or environmental factors that contribute to the pump programming errors. And the last suggestion is to protect the pumps from cybersecurity threats and develop downtime procedures when interoperability or wireless programming is unavailable. Preceding these recommendations in 2020, ISMP published guidelines for optimizing smart pump technology. These guidelines establish specific measurable goals for compliance with smart pump safety features. These include setting a 95% threshold for use of dose error reduction software for any medication or fluid infusion. Also included are recommendations for cleaning, maintaining, and adding equipment and reporting adverse events. Recommendations are made for maintaining the drug library, tracking, continuous quality improvement, clinical workflows, and interoperability. Our organization is working on these goals. On this slide, I listed some examples of metrics that may be useful to track. These can include the percentage of infusions programmed with guardrails and the percentage programmed with the EHR integration. Tracking good catches or near misses may also reveal areas of opportunity, as well as the overrides. This may be broken down by the library profile as well. As noted in the Joint Commission and ISMP guidelines, importance is placed on updating and maintaining the smart pump library. Another area of opportunity for improving medication safety outside of voluntary incident reports is through optimization and evaluation of electronic medical record alerts. In 2021, ECRI published a white paper regarding CPOE safety and alert fatigue. A number of organizations collaborated on this work, including uh, the American Medical Association, EPIC, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, ISMP, and the Joint Commission to name a few. The paper recognizes both the benefits of clinical decision alerts as well as the potential unintended consequences. 
there is a significant burden to the clinician associated with over alerting and alerts that are either inappropriate, ineffective, or nonspecific. The practice recommendations are cited here and are based on the four prongs of governance, monitoring, analysis, and optimization. A five rights model is outlined here for five points to consider when designing or evaluating an EHR alert. First, the content needs to include accurate, pertinent information. Next, the alert should be presented to the appropriate person to act on that information. Third, formatting needs to be taken into account to guide the right intervention. Next, consideration should be given if the EHR really is the best outlet for that alert. And finally, the timing of the alert in the clinical workflow should be taken into account. From the article, this slide provides specific examples of what information may be useful to evaluate when assessing a clinical alert. Valuable metrics include analyzing how many alerts have fired and who they fired for. Also identifying if the alert is firing as intended and if the logic should be evaluated. It's important to note what action was taken for the alert and if the attended outcome was achieved or not. Finally, this slide shares five questions that the team should consider when implementing or evaluating that alert. First, what problem is that alert going to solve? This seems intuitive, but it's important to note that this may change over time. Is the alert in line with the goals and policies of the organization? Often it's helpful to link the applicable policy to the alert as supporting evidence and an in the moment reference for the recipient. Is the alert beneficial? This can be answered when assessing the efficacy or the intended outcome. And finally, is an alert the appropriate tool? Clinical alerts are not the only tool in our toolbox, so this is an opportunity to take a step back and evaluate the workflow and other options that may need to be considered. An example of how our team applied these recommendations is for a clozapine best practice alert. When it was created, the intent of the alert was to ensure provider compliance with the REMS requirements. After this alert was live, there were updates that were made to those REMS requirements. Analysis of our BPA data did not reveal that it led to meaningful interventions. Furthermore, a different workflow process had been implemented within pharmacist verification. This analysis allowed our team to conclude that the BPA was no longer needed and could be discontinued or retired. Another example of BPA optimization was for an alert to pharmacists that a patient is receiving a modality of renal replacement, such as hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis. This alert is very popular among pharmacists who rely on this information to ensure appropriate medication dosing. Ongoing feedback from staff identified cases in which the alert was present for a patient not on dialysis, or was not present for a patient who was on dialysis. In collaboration with pharmacy and IT, it was identified that workflow changes with the problem list were associated with these gaps. A new trigger was designed, tested, and implemented to use a different type of logic to capture this information. The methodologies discussed up to this point focus on ways to improve medication safety aside from voluntary incident report investigations. It's worth noting that you'll also want to maximize the results and system learnings from these reports. Sharing our process, once a medication report is submitted in the internal investigation, is completed by the local leadership as well as by the medication safety officer. Every week, a multidisciplinary team meets to review all of the reports that are entered in that preceding week looking for trends and system improvement opportunities. Learnings are shared with staff, both for situational awareness of the concern and to communicate changes. Analysis of the incident reports data is generated on a monthly basis with follow-up with the pharmacy leadership team. Thank you, and I will now turn the program over to Shirley. Thanks so much, Meg. Our second speaker today is Anastasia Ahern. Anastasia is a fourth year pharmacy resident, a student, excuse me, at Jefferson College of Pharmacy in Philadelphia. 
She has been an intern at Reading Hospital since 2020. After pharmacy school, Anastasia plans to pursue a pharmacy residency. Her current interests are critical care and emergency medicine. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Anastasia. Thank you, Shirley. Um, today, I'll be talking about the technology for sterile and non-sterile compounding and medication delivery and technology that goes along with those. So an overview, um, we'll discuss the background on sterile compounding and some medication safety that goes along with um, compounding and then technology used in the clean room and also medication delivery and the technology used within delivering medications. So for um, sterile compounding, it's aseptic technique, which is a process that allows the end medication to be sterile enough for injection into the patient. So when a uh, pharmacy technician is in the clean room, they're usually creating IV infusions in this sterile room and this aseptic trans using this aseptic transfer technique. So the compounding technician is typically by themselves. They work independently and they start their day by cleaning the hood and um, cleaning the hood in the sterile room before they can start making anything. So everything is ensured to be clean. And then at Reading specifically, we have two cart fills each day on the day shift and one cart fill on the evening shift. And along with your cart fill, you have any stat medications that come through the um, farm come through from the pharmacist. And the technician usually has their own day plan on how they plan to finish these IV infusions before the um, deliveries go out. And there are a good amount of checks and balances with the IV medications that go through a pharmacist, a technician, or even multiple of pharmacists and technicians before they're sent out to the floor. And um, that's to ensure the highest level of patient safety. And then um, depending on the type of clean room and sterile products being made, there are three different restrictions. There's USP 795, USP 797, and USP 800. USP 795 is non-sterile compounding and USP 797 is sterile compounding. So that's what's done in the clean room and that's what the bulk of this, my presentation will be for today. And then USP 800 is hazardous drugs and that's specifically chemotherapy. So for clean room technology, there's many different um, things that can be used for clean room technology, but for safety specifically, before a technician even starts to be trained in the clean room, they must pass a math exam. There's a lot of math that goes into uh, compounding IV medications, uh, especially in the clean room. And it's recommended that the technician has a good understanding of how they can, um, how they can figure out the math for what goes in each IV bag before starting in the clean room. Um, and then a technician is trained for about three months with another technician and then towards the end, the trainer technician kind of steps out of the clean room and is only there for support if needed. Uh, that way the technician learning can get this field to be independent and be by themselves. And they first start by examining the technician and they'll, then they'll move into medications, the technician being trained. So there's a very specific type of way the hood is designed to make sure that everything stays sterile. So it's a lot of muscle memory for the technician learning it so they don't break airflow with these uh, laminar flow hoods. And there can be certain medications that must be checked by a pharmacist or a technician and have this double check. Some of those medications include anything for pediatric and NICU patients. So any patient under the age of 16, um, high alert medications like heparin and insulin and um, other syringe checks for um, stuff like Procrit and Epigen. And then there are softwares used that kind of help the pharmacist in this double checking the technician on what the technician's doing in the clean room. So some, some programs are able to take pictures of the syringes that the technician is using to insert into the bag and take pictures of the product, the lot number, the expiration, and the final product and the label. And other technologies other um, softwares that can be used look at just specific lot and expiration, and then the pharmacist can come in, check the syringes, check the lot and expiration, and that's kind of like a double check to the photo checking. And um, so they have their syringe checking and then the lot and expiration recording system. And if none of these are available, then the pharmacist 
makes the bag and they give all the ingredients used to the pharmacist and the pharmacist should be able to check from there if there are any questions then um, the pharmacist can ask the technician to either remake the bag or have a syringe check before making the bag. This picture here shows a few of the um, softwares I was talking about earlier. So the picture on the left shows all syringes laid out with different medications and bags hanging. So this would be what a typical like syringe check would look like. A technician would draw back the medication and then uh, ask the pharmacist to come and check the syringes for them. In the clean room specifically at Reading, the pharmacist sits in a different room than the technician does. So the technician is able to work independently, draw back these medications, have them all set out and continue working on something else while they um, notify the pharmacist to come and check this medication. And then the pharmacist comes in, looks at it, signs off and makes sure it's okay. And then the picture on the right shows a software that takes pictures of the medication for the pharmacist. So there's a scanner that scans the barcode and that records the lot and expiration in the software. Um, so that way, if there's ever a recall on a medication or anything where we have to look at the lot and expiration, it's recorded and it's able to be seen. And then the technician can draw back whatever they need and take a picture and then insert the medication into the bag and take another picture of the final product. And um, next I will move on to medication delivery. So um, a big job of technicians throughout a hospital is uh, medication delivery. Uh, so it's making sure that the medication is to the patient on time, making sure that it's the right medication in the right place and the nurse knows where it is for the next dose. So there's different technology that's used throughout this um, this medication delivery some there's medication tracking where you can scan barcodes on the medication make sure it gets to the uh nurse the nurse you can scan the nurse's badge you can scan the um automated dispensing cabinet there's a lot of scanning and checks and balances going on with the process of a moving medication it's kind of like fedex everybody kind of talks about it like you see your packages in uh like westchester and then it's at your house somewhere very close by. Um, so a signature of the receiving nurse or the automated dispensing cabinet is needed for dispensing patients uh, medications. So that was like I said earlier, you could get a signature or scanning and then just making sure medications are delivered on time. There's a good amount of short stability medications that um, have to be delivered within like right away so that they're to the patient. And I know one specifically is um, Mirapenem, Mirapenem has about a one hour stability. So that's something that when made in the IV room, the technician can make that within a couple of minutes of it being due. And then it's ran out to the floor or it's tubed very quickly to the floor. And the nurse is notified that this is a medication that has to be given right now because of its stability. Like it doesn't last after one hour. And the tube systems, they're also some uh, big technology used in medication delivery. They um, sometimes are very reliable and awesome when getting medications out very quickly but a lot of times there can be different issues with them and not always too sure where everything is so there's another system with scanning the tube scanning the medication sending it and then it's scanned when it's received and everything so there's a lot of scanning going on and making sure that medications are at the right place at the right time so this picture shows exactly what I was just saying, scanning the tube, scanning the medication, making sure everything was followed according to plan. And then in conclusion, as I've been um, saying for the last couple of minutes, um, there are many steps to ensure medication safety that through technicians and what technicians do in the hospital with just the workflow and the delivery of medications, the creating medications, the ensuring patient safety. Um, there's new technology currently, and I think in the next couple of years, there's going to be even more technology that's evolving. I feel like pharmacy has grown drastically in the last like six years. I've been a part of it, so um, it's going to be nice to see where it is in the next couple of years. Um, and I will turn this over back to you, Shirley. Thanks so much, Anastasia. Our final speaker for today is Gail Hawes. 
Gail is a certified pharmacy tech at Reading Hospital Tower Health and serves as the quality utilization and control specialist for the facility. Take it away, Gail. Thank you, Shirley. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to discuss the use of technology in control substance safety and diversion monitoring. The objectives of this presentation are to define drug diversion, review different technologies used to prevent drug diversion, including automated dispensing cabinets, electronic health record, and diversion monitoring software, and how these technologies were used to create system improvements. The American Society of Health System Pharmacists defines drug diversion as any act that removes a prescription drug from its intended path from the manufacturer to the intended patient. According to ASHP, 10 to 15% of healthcare workers misuse drugs or alcohol at some point during their careers. Healthcare workers have the same risk of misuse as the general population, but they have easier access to controlled substances. Drug diversion prevents risk to the impaired healthcare worker, their colleagues, patients, and the institution. There are safety measures that can be, can be implemented to prevent controlled substance diversion. One of the safety measures that can be implemented is the use of ADCs. ADCs support decentralized medication management with multiple safety and efficiency features. They allow medications to be stored near their point of care while controlling and tracking the distribution and use of medications. Inventory is customized based on the needs of the unit where the ADC is located, and it keeps a perpetual inventory to ensure that medications are always stocked to prevent delays in patient care. Reports are run to monitor usage, to ensure all necessary medications on the unit, and to set the appropriate PAR level. Users must perform a blind count when accessing controlled substances. If a discrepancy is created when counting the medication, the expectation is that a cycle count will be performed and the discrepancy is resolved with an appropriate reason. A resolution reason is required and the user can select a pre-bill option or they can type in a discrepancy reason. All resolutions require a witness. In addition to performing cycle counts when there is a discrepancy, every unit does a daily count on touch controlled substances and weekly for all controlled substances. Two users are required when doing cycle counts. The ADC alerts the user that waste needs to be performed when the medication is dispensed. If the user does not waste at that time, the ADC will alert them when they log in that they have outstanding waste. A waste reason is required and the user can select a pre-built option or type in a waste reason. A witness is required for all controlled substance waste. There are different access levels built into the ADC. Access is assigned based on the individual's role. Nurses only have access to the ADC on their unit, but they can be granted access to other units if they are covering an assignment on that unit. Alerts are set in the ADC to assist with preventing medication errors. While reviewing reports, it was found that nurses were pulling too many oxycodone tablets when patients were prescribed 15 milligrams. And the nurses did not realize that they were dispensing a 15 milligram tablet, so they would pull three tablets thinking that they were five milligrams each. An alert was put on the oxycodone 15 milligram tablets, notifying the nurse that this is a high dose tablet and that the dose should be verified prior to administration. Reports are run daily in the pharmacy to ensure that all medications that are dispensed from the pharmacy are restocked to the correct ADC. Checks are done on the pharmacy machines to ensure that cycle counts are performed. Medications that are expired are monitored to make sure that they are properly disposed of or put into the ADC where expired medications are stored prior to sending them to the reverse distributor. Reports are also utilized to monitor discrepancies, waste, and compounding transactions. The electronic health record is utilized to track medication scanning, pain scores, and MAR documentation. Medication scanning ensures accuracy of medication administration and that the patient is getting the correct drug. An alert will pop up letting the nurse know if there is an issue if the wrong medication is scanned. A witness may be required if the medication is not scanned prior to administration. Scanning may be bypassed if the barcode is torn when separating the unit doses or if the medication was taken out of the package prior to scanning. 
Pain scores are a valuable tool when drug diversion is suspected. The documented pain score can be utilized to ensure that pain medications were given within the ordered parameters and to verify if the pain score was similar amongst users. If there is a user that consistently documents pain scores higher than their peers, it may be a sign of drug diversion. The MAR also provides documentation that a medication was administered. The MAR helps prevent duplicate administrations and early medication administrations for controlled substances. There is an alert if the nurse tries to administer a medication too early. Diversion monitoring software tracks the dispenses, administrations, waste, and returns of controlled substances. Nurse managers and pharmacy look at open variances to monitor for drug diversion. Notes should be entered on every variance prior to them being closed for better tracking. Notes can be referenced if there are practice issues or suspected drug diversion. The software can break down the number of controlled substance transactions on each unit, the number of discrepancies closed by the software, and system data on the average time between dispense, administration, and waste for each unit. There are different access levels and roles built into the diversion monitoring software. Nurse managers only have access to the areas that they are responsible for. User analytics monitors full package waste, waste partners, time between dispense, administration, waste, and return, dispenses without corresponding administrations, and the number of total variances. User rankings can be used, excuse me, can be filtered across the hospital and by unit to compare each user to their peers. Analytics is a valuable tool when monitoring for diversion, but the data needs to be looked into due to it not always being reliable. Users may flag high due to medications that the patients bring from home, pharmacy compounded medications, and the software not always closing variances correctly. When there is suspected diversion, an investigation can be opened within the diversion monitoring software. Additional users can be assigned to an investigation and only assigned users can view the investigation. All documentation for suspected diversion can be uploaded so that it is all in one place and all assigned users will have access to the same information. There is an investigation checklist and user analytics can be uploaded to the investigation. If diversion is not confirmed, the investigation stays under that user in case issues arise in the future. After the investigation is complete, it will show if the investigation is open or closed and a reason for each. One way that reports were utilized to make process improvements is they helped identify that there was a large number of hydromorphone waste for 0.5 milligrams. Most units only had hydromorphone 1 milligram syringes stocked in their ADC, and we found that many transactions required a waste of 0.5 milligrams. Once this was identified, hydromorphone 0.5 milligram syringes were stocked on each unit in addition to the 1 milligram syringes. With collaboration from nursing, the transition began in September, where you can see usage decreased by around 400 syringes. Adding the hydromorphone 0.5 milligram syringes to the ADC decreased the risk of diversion 1,558 times from August before the transition in October. Decreasing the number of times waste is required also saved time because the nurses did not have to wait for someone to witness the waste, and the witness did not have to stop what they were doing to go into the med room. This change reduced waste and eliminated the opportunity to inadvertently administer too much medication rather than patient specific dose. Automated dispensing cabinets, electronic health records and diversion monitoring software can be used to decrease the risk of drug diversion and improve patient safety. Along with the use of technology, interdepartmental collaboration ensures that changes can be made to improve efficiency, decrease diversion risk and provide better care for the patients. Thank you, Bob and Shirley. I will now turn the program back over to you. I want to thank Megan, Anastasia, and Gail for a great presentation and a lot of useful information for our facilities. Um, now we'd like to begin our question and answer period. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. If you please click on the three dots, You'll click the Q&A to open the Q&A panel and then direct your questions to all panelists. And we will try to get to as, uh, and answer as many questions as we can. We have a few answer or a few questions that have come in already. Um, first question, Megan, I think this would be for you. Um, regarding infusion pump safety, 
What people or groups in your organization do you share this information with? Great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, this is a regular item that we report out for our medication safety committee, uh, both within the hospital level and then at a system level as well. It's also something that at times we'll take to the various councils and direct nursing groups to share on a local level as changes arise or information needs to be communicated. Okay, Anastasia, I think this might be for you. What, what should technicians do if they cannot find the patient's nurse when delivering medication? So um, typically if like a patient has a medication that needs to go directly to a nurse and they can't find the specific nurse. I know what I usually do is I see if I see a nurse, I ask if they know where the specific nurse is for this room or if they can point me in the direction or a lot of times they offer to take them and pass them along to the nurse, which is like really helpful. Um, if I don't see a nurse anywhere, I usually kind of wait around the front desk, see if anybody comes by. Um, but I've never had a problem eventually finding a nurse. It just takes a little bit of time. Okay. Uh, let's see the next question we had come in. Um, what is the user type requirement for cycle counts and discrepancy resolution? Like, does it need to be 2 nurses or could it be an RN and R respiratory therapist? Um, Gail, this might be for you. Thank you um, on the units. Typically 2 RNs perform the cycle counts and resolve discrepancies. However, pharmacy technicians, if they create the discrepancy, will go out and resolve it. In the pharmacy, normally it's a pharmacist and a pharmacy technician that performs cycle counts and resolve discrepancies. Great. Um, again, I just want to reiterate, if um, you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box, uh, which is found in the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, you just click on the three dots, click Q&A, and open the Q&A Q panel, and we'll be able to see your question. Um, next question, um, Megan, uh, what is the benefit of completing an MUE if I already have an incident report about a medication problem? Thanks, Bob. Great question. Um, so your incident report is going to be a snapshot of one patient that occurred, and that's certainly a situation worth investigating. But by doing the deeper dive investigation and doing the medication use evaluation, then you would be generating reports and looking at all patients who received that medication or had that condition. So the benefit is that it would be a less narrow focus and you would get a more complete picture of the full use of that medication across the area in question. Great. Um... Let's see the next question that came in. What happens when technology is not working for IV compounding? Anastasia, I think this is for you. Yeah, so um, typically when the photo machine or the um, recording uh, devices aren't able to be around, the technician will just draw up the medication and put it in the bag as you, like usual and just without taking any pictures. And then they give all the ingredients and all the medications and everything they use to the pharmacist. So if they needed to remove any normal saline dextrose or sterile water from the bag, they remove that in a syringe, leave the syringe in a bucket for the pharmacist, leave the drugs that they used in a bucket and give the final product with the label to the pharmacist. Okay. Um, Gail, how does the ADC alert help with waste documentation reminders or is it someone like a manager notified if there's waste that needs to be documented. How exactly does that process work? When a medication is dispensed in the ADC, it'll alert them at that time that a medication waste is required. If the RN chooses not to waste the medication at that time, it will alert them the next time they log in that there is still an outstanding waste for that medication. The manager is not notified if there is outstanding waste, but they will see a variance in our diversion monitoring software and it'll show that. You know, what was dispensed does not match what was wasted and administered so that the manager will have to follow up and find out what happened to the missing medication. Okay, Megan, um, another about the MU, another question about the MUE um, when you complete an MUE. Who do you share the information with? Thanks, 
Thanks, Bob. That's going to be very dependent on each project that you're working on. But in general, before undertaking that evaluation, you want to have a plan for who's interested in that information, who are your key stakeholders. Um, some common groups that we share that information with are the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. That's something that we routinely will complete them for and present that out to, since that encompasses a good array of providers throughout different specialties within our hospital. Uh, another group that we'll take those to might include the Medication Safety Committee. Again, another good group that has uh, representation to cover um, different areas of the hospital and then authority to approve any sort of changes that would be recommended. Um, other committees or groups may be suggested on an individual department basis, or if there's specific groups such as physicians or respiratory therapists that are pertinent to the review you're working on. So there's some key groups that tend to get the full report out, and then other groups would hear about that as well as it pertains to them. How about the patient safety committee? Would they be included in that loop also? Absolutely can be, yes. Um, that's another good group. And we tend to have pretty full agendas for that group. We have a lot of people who want to talk there, but that is something that we definitely take to them to share um, if that's something that's pertinent for their work as well. Great. Um, Gail, what, um, let's see, what was the change in the hydromorphone syringes prompted because of suspected diversion? Thank you, Bob. No, the changes in the hydromorphone syringes were actually noticed when we were looking at controlled substance reports and saw large amounts of waste. It was not part of a diversion investigation. Okay. So, with the adaptation of the diversion monitoring software, is it easier for your team to investigate diversions if they would happen? So the diversion monitoring software um, is one resource that we use when diversion is suspected. User analytics can help identify suspected diversion faster, but it is not the only tool that we use when we're investigating diversion. Okay. So just sticking with that topic, one, one other final question. How does the diversion monitoring software help with documentation if there is diversion? Um, ex uh, suspected. Great question, Bob. Thank you. So the diversion monitoring software has an investigation feature built into it where we can upload all of the documents associated with the suspected diversion. And that ensures that all of the documentation is in one place and that all users ha have access to the investigation and the same documentation can be viewed by everybody. And again, only assigned users can view it. So not everybody that's built into the diversion monitoring software will have access when, in, when diversion may be suspected. Okay. Megan, I think this question is for you uh, that just came through. How often does your facility review your VPAs uh, to determine their efficacy? And how would you recommend the new facility start this process there? Great question, Shirley. Um, specific for medication safety, um, we've undertaken a BPA review as a standing agenda item for our medication safety committee, starting with all of the BPAs that are sponsored by that group. Uh, one of the recommendations from our IT department is that all BPAs have a designated committee sponsor um, who owns and maintains and is responsible for that. And then that committee would, on a periodic basis, evaluate this. So that's something on an ongoing basis. We're always looking at different ones through that committee pertinent to medication safety that they are the sponsor for. Thanks, Meg. And then this final question I think can be posed to any of our panelists. Um, so we talked a lot about a technology today, which sounds great. Um, what processes do you have in place uh, when you have expected or unexpected downtimes for any of these processes that you use? So um, I can answer this with regards to the IV um, preparing and stuff and the technology there. Um, so it's similar to what I said when the um, software in the IV room isn't working, we kind of do this like old in an old school way. Um, the technician just draws everything up and the pharmacist checks it by hand um, and 
um, usually there is another software that's used to record lots and expirations for big compounding batches. And um, if that's down, we'll usually write everything out on a piece of paper of the lot and expirations that we use, and then eventually go in and and enter that in when the um, downtime has restarted. Okay, the webinar is going to be soon uh, ending. If we have time for another question or so, if you have a question, like I said, put it into the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen. Megan, I have one other question for you that came through. Um, how often do you update your smart pump library? Oh, good question. Uh, that's something that's updated on an ongoing basis. Historically, we started out with about quarterly updates, but as we got into the pandemic, we recognized that updates were needed much more frequently. So that is something we do on an ongoing basis as needed, sometimes as often as monthly, um, as there are new medications that are added or an update to our existing settings that are determined to be needed. Um, so we no longer have a defined rigid schedule for when it needs to be completed. That's something we do complete on an ongoing basis. And we do have a planned communication pathway that nursing is notified in advance when those library updates are going to occur um, in case they do need to restart the pumps or if there's other action that our staff needs to be aware of that will be communicated out in advance. Fantastic. Again, I want to thank um, thank our speakers today, um, Megan, Gail, and Anastasia. Um, Shirley, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. I would also like to thank our guest speakers today for an excellent presentation and to all of you who have attended today. If you experienced any issues accessing the evaluation and or certificate of continuing education, please feel free to direct any inquiries to our amazing admin, Shelly Mikesell at S-H-M-I-X-E-L-L -L at PA.gov. This concludes our webinar. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.